A Treatise of Satan's Temptations By Richard Gilpin A Discourse of the Malice, Power, Cruelty and Diligence of Satan 7th Part of Chapter 17 Satan's Deceits Against Religious Services and Duties The Grounds of His Displeasure Against Religious Duties, and More 4. Fourthly, He Improves the Grace of the Gospel to Infer an Unnecessariness of Duty and this he doth not only from the advantage of a profane and careless spirit, in such as presumptuously expect heaven, though they mind not the way that leads to it. For with such it is usual as one observes, for Satan to sever the means from the end, in things that are good. To make them believe they shall have peace, though they walk in the imaginations of their heart. To make them lean upon the Lord for heaven, in the apparent neglect of holiness and duty. As in evil things, he severs the end from the means, making them confident they shall escape hell and condemnation though they walk in the path that leads thither. But besides this, he abuseth the understandings and affections of men, by strange and uncouth inferences. As that God hath received a satisfaction, and Christ hath done all, so that nothing is left for us to do. The Apostle Paul was so much aware of this kind of arguing, that when he was to magnify the grace of God, he always took care to fence against such perverse reasonings, severely rebuking and refelling such objections, as in Romans 3 7, 8 were speaking that our unrighteousness did commend the righteousness of God, he falls upon that reply, Why then am I judged as a sinner? Which he sharply refels, as an inference of slanderous imputation to the gospel, which hath nothing in it to give the least countenance to that conclusion, Let us do evil, that good may come, and adds, that damnation shall justly overtake such as practice accordingly. The like we have, Romans 6 1, Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? Which he rejected with the greatest abhorrency, God forbid. From both which places we may plainly gather, that as unsound as such arguings are, yet men, through Satan's subtlety, are too prone, upon such pretenses, to dispute themselves to a careless neglect of duty. This might be enlarged in many other instances, as that of Maximus Tyrius, who disputed all duties unnecessary upon this ground. That what God will give, cannot be hindered. And what he will not give, cannot be obtained. And therefore it were needless to seek after anything. Much to the same purpose do many argue, if they be predestinated to salvation, they shall be saved, though they do never so little. If they be not predestinated, they shall not be saved, though they do never so much. In all which inferences, the devil proceeds upon a false foundation of severing the means in the end, which the decree of God hath joined together. But the main of the design is to hide the necessity of duty from them. 5. Fifthly, by urging a necessity or conveniency, for suspending or remitting duties. In temptations to sin, he doth from a little draw on the sinner to more. But in omissions of duty he would entice us from much to little, and from little to nothing. Very busy he is with us to break or interrupt our constant course of duty. Duties in order and practice, are like so many pearls upon one string. If the thread be broken, it may hazard the scattering of all. If we be once put out of our way, we are in danger to rove far before we be set in our rank again. To effect this, one, he will be sure to straighten, or hinder us in our opportunities if he can, and then to plead necessity for a dispensation. It is true indeed, necessities, when unavoidable, as the issue of providence, rather than our negligence, may excuse an omission of duty, because in such cases, God accepting the will for the deed, will have mercy and not sacrifice. But necessity is most what a pretense, or cover to the slothfulness of professors, and the devil will do all he can, to gratify them in that humor and to prepare excuses for them from such hindrances, or interruptions as business or disturbances can make. Yet if these be not in readiness, he will, do, endeavor to take off our earnestness, by suggesting to us our former diligence. That we at other times have been careful and active. Or, 3, by setting before us the greater negligence of those that are below us. The meaning of both, which insinuations is to this one purpose, that we may make bold with some omissions, without any great hazard of our religious intentions. Or scandal and offense to others. Now, if he can by any of these ways, bring us to any abatement of our wanted care and exercise, he will then still press for more. And from fervency of spirit to a cold moderation. From thence he will labor to bring us down to seldom performances. From thence, to nothing. The spiritual sluggard that will be overcome to some neglects, shall be found a companion at last to a waster, Proverbs 18 9. And will be brought to a total neglect of all. The Church of Ephesus, Revelation 2 4, 5, may sadly give proof of this. They left their first love, 
and from thence declined, so far that at last God was provoked to remove the candlestick out of its place. 6. Sixthly, Satan put tricks upon men, in order to the hindering of duty, by putting us from a service presently needful. With the proposal of another, in which, at that time, we are not so concerned. In several duties of Christianity there is a great deal of skill required to make a right choice, for present or first performance, and to have a right judgment to discover the times and seasons of them, is matter of necessary study. Our adversary observing our weaknesses in this, when no other art will prevail, endeavors to put us upon an inconvenient choice, when he cannot make us neglect all. As, one, by engaging us in a less duty, that we may neglect a greater, he is willing that we, as the Pharisees, should tithe mint and anise, upon condition that we neglect the greater things of the law. This was the fault of Martha, Luke 10 41, who busied herself in making entertainment for Christ's welcome, and in the meantime neglected to hear his preaching, which, as he notes, was the only necessary duty of that time, one thing is necessary. She is not blamed for doing that which was simply evil in itself, for the thing she did was a duty, but for not making a right choice of duty. For that rebuke, Mary hath chosen the better part, is only a comparative discommendation. As Austin interprets, non tu malam, sed illa meliorum, the thing thou doest is not evil, if it had not put thee upon a neglect of a greater good. 2. He sometimes puts men upon what is good and necessary, but such as they cannot come at without sin. Thus sacrificing in itself was a necessary duty. And such was Saul's condition, that it concerned him at that time, to make his peace with God, and to inquire his mind. Yet when the devil upon that pretense, put him upon offering a sacrifice, he put him upon no small transgression. 1 Samuel 13 13. The light game Satan sometimes plays with private Christians, who are persuaded beyond their station and capacity, in reference to some ordinances of God. 3. He sometimes puts men upon dangerous undertakings, in pursuit of their fancy, of gaining an advantage for some service. And so are they turned out of the way of present obedience, in grasping at opportunities of duty out of their reach. Saul spared the sheep and oxen of the Amalekites for sacrifice, 1 Samuel 15 15, 22, when obedience had been more acceptable than sacrifice. 4. There is a further cheat in the choice of duty, when Satan employs them to provide for duties to come, to the neglect of duties presently incumbent upon them. Whereas we are more concerned in that, which at present is necessary, than in that which may be so for the future. Which is a mistake, like that of caring for the morrow, while we use not what God puts in our hand for today. Thanks.